Thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Ignacio, for the introduction. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, the Basque children, as you know. It's going to be uh, kind of a general overview, I think, so if you're a deep expert, please don't be disappointed. I've tried to, in, in, um, I've tried to include quite a lot of primary research material uh, to try and enliven it a little bit if you're a deep expert. So I hope it's going to speak to two audiences, both the experts who are here and people who are just here to find out about. Can you hear me? Because I, yeah, I have a very quiet voice. Can you hear me now? If I do this rock and roll thing. Okay, let's rock. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I'd like to... I'd like to start with this front page from the Frankfurt uh, newspaper, Abbe Fay, from the 2nd of April, 1939, which proclaims General Franco's victory in the Spanish Civil War of 1936 to 1939. The text at the bottom, which you probably can't see, I'm afraid, but um, what it says is uh, that the Red Army has been disarmed, rounded up, and that the war is over. This is why, of course, this March and April we are commemorating the 80th anniversary of the end of the conflict. That the date marks the victory of Franco's troops and their allies from Nazi Germany and Mussolini's Italy against the elected centre-left government of the Spanish Second Republic. It also represents a victory dreaded by anti-fascist groups across Europe. I'm just changing my uh, It also represents a victory dreaded by anti-fascist groups across Europe, including the United Kingdom, where tens of thousands of people donated money to support the, rock, the Republic, and around 2,000 people volunteered to fight Franco in the International Brigades to brought together volunteers from around 53 countries. But without becoming too philosophical, I'm not convinced that late March 1939 is exactly when the war finished, or at least not in the whole of Spain. In fact, the Civil War grew into a steady process of occupation, and once Franco's forces rolled into one area of Spain, the fighting, if not the violence, stopped. And the, the map that you can perhaps not see so well on, on that screen actually tells that story. So the Civil War starts in July 1936, as I'm sure many of you know, as a, a failed coup. Uh, the coup was successful, if you can see broadly, in the areas that are white. Um, and then over time, the Francoists, or the people grouped around Franco, gradually march into one area of Spain after another. So just to give you a, a, a basic idea, uh, Malaga fell in early February 1937, Bilbao, Bilbao in June 1937, and Barcelona in January 1939, and Madrid falls at the end of March uh, 1939, beginning of April 1939. Even though the war did not end at the same time for all, we can detect a common pattern underlying the end of the war in cities such as Malaga and Barcelona. Ordinary people were all too frequently killed or injured as the front line advanced across their hometowns. A tragedy made worse by the fact that the military commanders did not always shy away from causing such suffering. One of the most infamous examples occurred in Malaga in February 1937, when observers at the time estimated that 20,000 people fled the city towards government-held Almeria. Malaga is on the south coast, as you know, Almeria is further over uh, to the east on the north south coast. The road they followed helped a narrow strip of land between the coastline and the mountains, and those scurrying for their lives endured pounding from the sea by Franco's navy. The Canadian doctor, uh, Norman Bethwain, witnessed the suffering at first hand and described what he saw as, quote, the most terrible evacuation in modern times. <coughs> Let me provide you with a quote from Beth Wayne to give you a sense of what he, what he meant. Um, this is what he says, and this is the, I put the quote on the, on, the, on the screen for you. There were thousands of children, we counted 5,000 under 10 years of age, and at least 1,000 of them barefoot, and many of them clad only in a single garment. They were slung over their mother's shoulder or clung to her hands. 
Her father, here, her father staggered along with two children of one or two years of age on his back, in addition to carrying pots and pans or some treasure possession. And here are some uh, photos that come from the book or a short pamphlet that was written by uh, Norman Twain. So you can see some of the, the, the scenes there. The British writer T.C. Worsley, who was close to Stephen Spender at the time, had volunteered in Spain to help with blood transfusions and witness the refugees arriving in the area. He's left us with an account of a child he rescued. Once I noticed a little boy who could not have been more than eight, standing swaying with his finger in his mouth, looking vacantly at the lorry, thinking he was lost. I went over to him and asked where his mother and father were. The child, who could only speak in a hoarse whisper, answered unemotionally and dully, dead, all dead. He had walked from Malaga by himself, five days on the road, alone and without food, and now he was complaining of the cold. I picked him up and put him into the cabin. It was at least warm there. He dropped instantly asleep. Children also fell victim to frontline bombing, and never more infamously than the attack on the Basque town of Guernica between 4.30 uh, and 7 p.m. on the afternoon of the 26th of April, 1937. Again, we possess graphic testimony that speaks to the horror of war, and particularly its effect on children. It hails from a book compiled by the activist and novelist Yvonne Cap, who published under the name Yvonne Cloud, who worked with Basque refugees from Spain and later with Jewish refugees from Czechoslovakia. This is part of the account, of the account she took from a Basque child who had found sanctuary in the UK. Um, there was the mother, sorry, there was the mother with two children and the old grandmother and the old grandmother. The planes circled about the wood for a long time and at last frightened them out of it. They took shelter in a ditch. We saw the old granny cover up the little boy with her apron. The planes came low and killed them all in the ditch, except the little boy. He soon got up and began to wander across a field, crying. They got him too. It was terrible. We were both crying out so much we could not speak. So Guernica is very famous for the bombing, but what also took place was um, strafing using machine guns on uh, civilians, so that that's what that is uh, described. The end of the fighting did not bring an end to the suffering, a fact which further brings into question, or raises the question of when the Civil War finished. Let's take the example of the city of Malaga, conquered with the great help of Mussolini's Italian forces, but largely occupied by Franco's own men. In March 1937, a couple of months into the occupation, Mussolini's personal representative in Spain, uh, the fascist, uh, Roberto Farinacci, complained vociferously that Franco had embarked on a senseless policy of vengeance. So this is the case that the, the, the Italian fascists were actually uh, appalled by what they saw. The Italians estimated, the Italians estimated that 5,000 people had lost their lives in Malaga, this is to behind the lines violence, although we now know the figure stands at 7,000. Knowledge of such slaughter soon spread across Spain, and the disconcerted Basques in particular worked hard with the Vatican to negotiate a surrender with guarantees for the civilian population. They also began mass evacuations in case no terms could be made with the Franquists, terms which would protect civilians. They also began mass evacuations, sorry, I just said that. So they began these mass evacuations, and the historian James Cable estimates that over the summer of 1937, around 100,000 people fled from northern Spain, and most of them to France. The frontline violence, repression, and exile smashed apart families. Take the case of Emilia <coughs> Aradiran, whose two sons were evacuated to the United Kingdom. The British government would not allow parents to join their children, and she fled to France. 
Even as late as June 1945, <coughs> she'd heard nothing from her husband since the city's fall in June 19, uh, since the fall of Bilbao in June 1937. <coughs> this surely meant that he'd either been killed on the front line or in the barns behind the lines. Poverty also trapped sorry, poverty also trapped many of those who suffered the violence. The case of Maria Rodriguez Sescu illustrates the point. She was a 38-year-old housewife, a mother of eight children, and her husband was murdered by Franco supporters at the start of the war in the city of Pamplona, a city where 3,000 uh, people were executed behind the lines. In December 1936, uh, the mayor of Pamplona uh, wrote this, which I found in, in, in one archive. Um, She's absolutely no means to support herself, neither has she any relatives who can help her with her eight children, the oldest of whom is 14, and the youngest just one month old. Maria Rodriguez was forced to place her children in Francoist care homes. She couldn't afford to look after the, the children herself. This was precisely the fate that many of Franco's opponents feared. The avant-garde writer, Carlotta O'Neill, suffered years of imprisonment from the start of the Civil War after her, her, after her husband went before a firing squad for his opposition to the Francoists. He was in the Republican Air Force. While she served time, her two daughters went into a Francoist care home. The treatment they received there plunged Carlotta into despair, and she bemoaned care homes, um, which she said, and this is from her memoir, uh, featured pictures of Franco on the wall, hymns sung in the morning and evening, these are fascist <coughs> anthems, basically, while making the fascist salute, being made to parade like Nazi fascists, and the constant humiliation inflicted by those men who'd killed their father. So these, in many cases, are people who have committed themselves to the Republican cause. They put their lives on the line to fight um, a set of ideas and principles that they profoundly disagree with. Parents then, and particularly politicized parents from the center left, had much to fear from the approach, the approach of the front line in Franco's occupation. Viewed from this perspective, it is easy to understand why some parents would choose to send their beloved children abroad without the parents accompanying them, so unaccompanied children. To do so, they would need the help of compassionate aid workers dedicated to rescuing those in peril. One example comes in the Quakers, who in early 1936 had representatives in Spain carrying out missionary work but who turned to charity work on behalf of the victims of war once the conflict started in July 1936. So the Quakers were going to be one of the big groups that supplied food and a whole wide range of humanitarian support to both sides uh, in the Spanish Civil War. So they focused on providing <coughs> food and milk, and most particularly to children who many people at the time regarded as particularly vulnerable to disease and the long-term ill effects of a poor diet. And the poor diet was in large measure caused by the, um, by the war itself. In Barcelona, the Quakers opened a milk distribution center in the poor fifth district. And I think this quote gives you a, a Sorry, I missed over a slide there. Um, I think this quote gives us an idea of some of the, the suffering caused by the food shortages behind the lines. So she said, well, this is a quote from the from the uh, Mothers who had searched in vain for any kind of food suitable to give a young child would come weeping to the director of the canteen, showing babies with wasted limbs who could not possibly be refused admission. Support also came from the National Joint Council for Spanish Relief. It came into the world in November 1936 as a cross-party committee <coughs> formed by MPs such as Eleanor Rathbone. Um, and it 
soon became an umbrella group that brought together around 800 organizations that included the Quakers, who I've just mentioned, other charities like Save the Children, and also organizations like the Salvation Army and the Catholic Church. These groups sent food, powdered milk, and clothing to Spain, often with funds donated by masses of ordinary people. So one of the features of the Spanish Civil War and its impact on the United Kingdom is that there's a huge Aid Spain campaign that brings together people from organizations like the Left Book Club, uh, the Cooperative Movement, and some of these charities that raise enormous amounts of, of money. So it's a, a mass campaign. These, um, one, of the uh, one of the National Joint Committee's first acts was to help evacuate 4,000 children from Madrid in the autumn of 1936. So they sent uh, vehicles and uh, provided money to help with that transport. Uh, many of these children went to Barcelona or Valencia, which were considered safer because they weren't besieged. They were also considered healthier because the climate was warmer and children uh, would prosper better in those areas. Aid workers associated with the National Joint Committee found that they could collaborate with the Basque regional government to help evacuate youngsters. The Basque government enjoyed tremendous independence from Madrid because it was largely cut off from the rest of government-held territory. So there's a whole swathe of territory between uh, Bilbao and Madrid that was held by uh, Franco and his community. <coughs> The Basque government had also largely come under the control of the Basque Nationalist Party, the PNV. By the 1930s, the PNV had fallen under the influence, in large part, of Christian Democrats who opposed the violence and militarism of fascism and shared a fervent belief in defending human life as well as enforcing the laws of war. In February 1936, the PNV leader, José Antonio Aguirre, had declared, uh, and I think this gives us an insight into the thinking of the PNB leaders um, to some extent at least. Uh, we want to end this barbarous struggle and the savage cruelty demeaning of civilized countries. Let's put an end to reprisals, cruelty, torture, and everything that is making Spain the most backward nation in Europe. So the PNB developed this policy of humanizing the war um, and they became involved in all kinds of exchange schemes and evacuation schemes that formed part of that uh, policy. During the war, the PMV also set out to protect brass children from Francoist occupation and, const and strongly criticized uh, the Francoist. And I'll give you the quote. This is rather similar to the quote we have from Falotto O'Neill earlier, who was horrified by the, um, the Francoist care homes and the education that the children were receiving. One of the sub-themes of the Spanish Civil War is a battle over education, methods of education, whether it's going to be a Catholic education or a more secular scientific education. Um, and the PNV is a Catholic party, but it's uh, a supporter of a more kind of open and free education. So the um, PNV uh, strongly criticized the Francoist, and this is the quote, effort to inculcate in young people and above all, in Basque children, those ideals that contradict the essentially democratic spirit of the Basques and to impose a totalitarian authoritarianism. So there's a kind of element of Basque nationalism in there, I suppose, but there's also this battle for the soul, we might say, of the children. Activists uh, from the National Joint Council and representatives of the Basque government managed to overcome British government opposition to the evacuation of Basque children to the United Kingdom. Between September and December 1936, the Basque government took under its wing 30,000 children who had fled from the Francoist advance from areas such as San Sebastián. So right from the beginning of the Civil War, the Francoists uh, take over certain parts of uh, the Basque country, Irún, which is on the border with France, and later San Sebastián. Thousands of people are fleeing from those areas and they're heading towards the area of Bilkaya, Bilbao, controlled by the, um, the Basque government. The duty to protect children in Spain soon turned into the desire to evacuate children overseas, especially after Bilbao suffered a bombing attack in early January 1937 
and the Basque authorities began to register the name of children whose parents hoped to evacuate their <coughs> offspring to France. Some children left in early March 1937, but huge evacuations to France started when the Francoists launched their offensive against the Basque country on the 31st of March uh, 1937. And just to give you a digression if you don't know the history, uh, the Francoists had originally, at the start of the Civil War, they'd had a failed coup. Franco's uh, crack troops were shuttled over by Mussolini and uh, Hitler's planes from Morocco, where the colonial army was based. They cut a sway through south Spain towards Madrid. They besieged Madrid uh, really up until about November 1937. That battle doesn't go very well for the Francoists. Uh, Madrid remains besieged as a symbol of anti-fascism for, for, for people who fall like that. The Francoists then decide to pick off one town after another and leave the, the battle in, in, in Madrid. Uh, as a kind of quiet front. So they go, first of all, to Malaga. They conquer that in February 1937. Then they set their sights on uh, the Basque country and build Bilbao. So that campaign begins on the 31st of March, uh, 1937. General Mola led the advance and helped deepen worries in leaflets dropped on the Basque country, which warned that, and this is the quote, if your submission is not immediate, I will raise Bithkaya to the ground, and I have ample means to do so. So that puts into context the fear that was produced by the bombing of uh, Guernica. The British presented a thorn in the side for those hoping to evacuate children from such terrible threats. The British had not accepted refugees since the First World War, when incidentally thousands of child refugees were born from Belgium, uh, which the British had pledged to protect in the First World War. But since the First World War, they hadn't really accepted uh, refugees. The far from compassionate British press had even balked at helping child refugees uh, at, during and after the First World War. Just to give you an, an idea of the, well, give you a sense, I guess, of time and place and uh, what uh, people were thinking. Um, Here's a quote that comes from uh, the 19th of November, 1921, from the Daily Express. It's referring to the Russian Civil War. Uh, if you don't know the history of Save the Children Fund, Save the Children Fund was started during the uh, First World War, shortly after the First World War, uh, by activists who were horrified by children who were starving in um, Austria, um, Germany, as a result of the British blockade um, and the continuing blockade, was the Versailles sanctions, were, was the Versailles talks were still going on. So, uh, Save the Children Fund became quite controversial because um, lots of people basically hated the Germans after the during the First World War and, and didn't feel particularly compassionate towards them. And this kind of extends into the Russian Civil War, which was being fought in 1921, uh, which gives us the context for this quote. Uh, which, as I say, comes from the Daily Express. We have taken exception to the appeal of the Save the Children and other funds, the object of which is to minister to foreign needs. We do so because we consider that all our resources, private as well as public, are needed to relieve the distress which exists among our own, uh, our own people. Perhaps this rings uh, familiar to some of you. Um, the Save the Children Fund is specially concerned with the relief of the Russian famine. The extent of that, quest, that calamity is questionable, and they did doubt it. But however great it may be, we contend that this is not the moment for appeal to be made, for money to be sent out of the country. So I think that gives you a sense of some of the uh, feeling that um, activists had to try and overcome in order to help the children from the Basque country or children from Spain. For its part, the British government, although it did contribute funds towards humanitarian relief in Spain, consistently <coughs> refused to bear the cost of supporting refugees escaping war <coughs> and oppression. British decision-making reflected the lack of compassion in influential circles. It also stemmed from a reluctance to upset the Francoists, who opposed the evacuations because they argued their military advance presented no threat to civilians. Franco's men also maintained that the refugee issue 
was invented to discredit the insurgents. The Frankists further con uh, claimed sovereign control of the seas and resented any attempt to break the blockade they had mounted on the northern coast to starve their opponents into submission. So part of the context of this is that the Francoists are desperately seeking uh, international legitimacy. They've started a, a war as a coup d'etat you know, against the elected government. Uh, they're constantly portraying themselves as uh, humanitarian and fighting according to the laws of war. Um, and so the, the whole idea of evacuating children from the, from the danger behind the lines, or even atrocities on the front line, uh, kind of undermined that, that strategy. The Basque government worked to overcome the opposition of His Majesty's government, that's the British government, by liaising closely with the compassionate British consul in Bilbao, R.C. Stevenson. On the 8th of April, 1937, Stevenson cabled London, pressing the government to accept the Basque suggestion of large-scale evacuation. The Royal Navy, however, did not want to put its ships in harm's way by flouting the, blo the, the Francoist blockade. Equally, the Foreign Office feared it would be drawn into ever larger humanitarian rescue work. In the meantime, a scandal had broken in the British press over the great British merchant fleet being pushed about by the relatively puny Francoist Navy. So there were a group of British merchant ships that had basically tried to uh, run the so-called Francoist blockade, and there was a dispute about how effective the, the blockade was. A number of newspaper correspondents had uh, come along one from the Times, particularly importantly, and had said, uh, what's the great British um, Navy doing not protecting our ships uh, from Francoist um, attack? So, in this furore, the British government undertook to deploy the Royal Navy to protect ships evacuating uh, refugees to France. By late April 1937, the Basque government had also convinced Leah Manning, a National Union of Teachers activist prominent in the National Joint Committee, to travel to Bilbao to help with the evacuation of children. A crucial development came on the 26th of April with the bombing of Guernica, the first mass de destruction of an open European town by aerial bombardment. So there would be lots of other towns in uh, places like Iran and other uh, Ethiopia that had been bombed, but what was different about Guernica was it was a European town, it was an undefended town, and there were newspaper correspondents there who could bring to the public uh, eye uh, what had happened. And this was an absolute terrible shock to lots of people around the world, including the United Kingdom, where there was a developing fear of aerial bombardment. This was the idea that the Second World War was coming, and that it was going to be even worse than the First World War and would feature uh, mass destruction. So the atrocity caused an international scandal, particularly in the United Kingdom, uh, where lots of people feared British citizens would be next. Uh, this guy from the Times newspaper, a guy called George Steer, who broke that story and became involved in a big dispute with the Francoists about whether Guernica had been bombed or not. The Francoists said it hadn't been burnt down by the uh, people who lived there or by uh, dynamiters who'd come from mines um, nearby. Okay. Um, so it's in this climate of absolute shock uh, that sentiment grew in favour of the evacuation of children to the United Kingdom. Under pressure, on the 29th of April, the Home Office granted permission for the vast children to be brought to the United Kingdom, provided the children were repatriated as soon as possible, children were brought from families across the political spectrum, and that the British government would not defray the costs. The British government wasn't putting up money to, to pay for this. In response, and shortly afterwards, the National Joint Committee founded the Bass Children's Committee to raise funds and organize the evacuation. According to the London Times, and, uh, we have a, an email there. Where is it? Could you um, So according, thank you Simon, according to the London Times, at 7.30 a.m. on the 23rd of May, 1937, 
3,826 child refugees, 15 priests, and 60 Catholic teachers, and I think there is a still a bit of a dispute about the exact numbers, arrived aboard this ship that uh, we can see uh, here, uh, the Correo de Havana at Southampton Dock. The children were met both by compassion and prejudice, or by the compassion and prejudice, that continues to shape the lives of those refugees who make it to British shores. The children were first taken to a makeshift camp in North Stoneham, which is near um, Southampton. You can see some images here. The one on the left is an aerial shot. As you can see at the camp, you can see how well uh, laid out it is. And then there's a shot of everyday life if you like, uh, in, the, in the camp. So they were taken first to this makeshift camp at North Stoneham. Um, and on the 25th of May, the Aberdeen Press and Journal, a newspaper, reported that nearly 4,000 children, and the quote is, were tucked in warm blankets in the serenity and security of the English countryside. <laughs> um, by the 25th of May, the children were settling into the camp, although the Times reported that the Air Ministry had banned aircraft from flying over the camp as the children were terrified of planes which they believed had pursued them from Spain. By the 25th of May, local groups of the Jack Basque Children's Committee <coughs> had started coming forward with offers to help house groups of children, basically in groups of children, sometimes known as colonies, which were designed to keep the children together, to help them um, maintain their language and cultural identity. Um, Please don't blame me for this. I'm from the University of Leeds. I'm going to give you some examples from Yorkshire, but it's not because I'm a Yorkshire nationalist. It's just because they're, they're honest. They're just the ones that I, I came across. So here's just a couple of examples. The Leeds Children, Children's Aid Subcommittee um, that proved willing to take 200 of the children, and an old hostel was being fitted out in Scarborough to house a, to house a further 200 children and committees have been set up in Harrogate and Wakefield. They're just examples of local activists um, getting together to try and help these children who would be dispersed uh, across the country. But prejudice, uh, but prejudice also coursed through British veins, and the Gloucester Citizen, I uh, don't know if anybody's read this newspaper, but one of the advantages of the internet is you can find all of these uh, newspapers. So I've got these, these quotes. So the Gloucester Citizen reported on the 28th of June that Sir Oswald Mosley contended that no help should be afforded to Basque children while there were British youngsters starving. This lack of compassion from those overseas was not confined to fascists like Mosley. Instead, it fed into wider political prejudice against um, groups of children considered to be reds. The children themselves, who had fled highly politicized Spain, had helped consolidate this impression with their gestures of the clenched red fist salute. But uh, political prejudice also meant that their understandable trauma was read as red barbarity. We can see this on the night of Saturday the 19th of June, 1937. Bilbao had fallen that night, and the children had been horrified by the possible fate of their parents who might fall victim to Franco's death squads, or who could easily be killed as civilians retreated from Bilbao towards Santander, where they hoped to escape by sea. Bear in mind the story of Malaga that I told you about earlier in um, Yvonne Cloud, the cap, described the scene after, they were, after the children in the camp were told of Bilbao's, Bilbao's fall. This is what she said. A loud shriek went up, followed by a dreadful wailing, a mourning, and a, lament a lamentation, punctured by cries of mother, which lasted for many hours. Unforgettable scenes of weeping and despair, the tragic swaying and the moaning and cries which rose to hysteria. <coughs> we also have uh, the voice of some of the children who explained their horror about the fall of the bound in a letter they sent to Neville Chamberlain, who became Prime Minister uh, in May 1937, who, and they, in which they stated uh, the following. 
and this is a direct quote that I took uh, this time from the Belfast Telegraph. We have heard, uh, this letter by the way is also in the Foreign Office archives in Kiel in London. Um, we have heard with great sorrow that our mothers, sisters and dear grandparents, very fallen years, have been criminally bombarded by Franco's aircraft while they were escaping along the road from Bilbao to Santander. We have also heard that the English ships will not escort, escort those people who cannot escape by road as they once escorted us. So basically a lot of the Basques who escaped from Bilbao made it to Santander, where in, particularly in August 1937, a lot of them were kind of holed in in that area. And the British government wasn't being too helpful in uh, guaranteeing the safe evacuation of, of those children. And people like Eleanor Rathbone, the backbench MP, uh, was very vociferous and active in trying to force the British government into preventing precisely this problem that the children or adolescents themselves had um, foreseen. So, in these circumstances, on, on this night, on uh, Saturday, June, uh, June the 19th, about 300 children escaped from the, or broke out of, uh, the, camp, the camp at North Stoneham. Uh, it was this kind of disorder that attracted quite a lot of negative publicity from people who weren't sympathetic to, to their cause. The Catholic universe had this to say after disorder broke out at the Scarborough Home, which is in July 1937. The lawlessness which has appeared is the direct outcome of the godlessness with which the children have been impregnated. An appalling aspect of the matter is that sensitive, well-bred children are mixed up in the camps throughout the country with the rebel element. Okay, to understand this quote, I need to explain to you that uh, the Catholic Church had been involved in the evacuation of the uh, children. Uh, the Archbishop of Westminster, a guy called Hinsley, felt that he'd been um, bounced into helping the Basque children because one of the Basque uh, bishops had sent out a letter appealing for Catholics around the world uh, to help the Basque children. And he, so the Catholic Church took on about 1,200 of these children. But Hinsley was actually quite deeply opposed to the Second Republic, which he associated with uh, a secular attempt to limit the power of the church. He saw some of the violence that took place at the beginning of the Civil War as an attack on the church. And he became mixed up very quickly with attempts to repatriate the children, which I'm, I'm going to come on to. And one of the things you need to see here is that the people who were supporting the elected government are being referred to as the rebel element. So they have to turn uh, history around, if you like. Um, so basically, um, people who support the government are, are rebels and they're a danger. The Basque Children's Committee argued that only a few boys had been involved and that guardians had swiftly restored order. But the children were soon to become swept up in political disputes that left little room for nuance. Following the capture of Bilbao, the Franquists launched a campaign for the repatriation of the children. The, ton, the context for this campaign comes from the denial of Franco's atrocities. Franco's propaganda machine was engaged in this campaign on several fronts. The denial of the Guernica bombing stands out, but so too does the denial um, that the Franquists had carried out uh, the killing of Catholic Basques, and particularly several PNV supporting Basques. So the, the, the Basque Nationalist Party, the Catholic Party, had strong support from uh, Basque priests. This divided the Catholic Church, as I've just pointed out, uh, Catholicism and the defense of the church become one of the crucial issues in the Civil War. And, and it was quite embarrassing for the Franquists that there was this uh, alternative view of the role of the church. Okay, um, and the, one of the particular aspects of this um, is that the Franquists had murdered about 11 or 12 uh, Basque priests uh, in the autumn and spring, autumn of 1936 and spring of 1937, and this had really annoyed the Pope, so there were tensions between the Pope and, and Franco. The Francoists also hoped to portray their occupation of Bilbao as peaceful and orderly, 
and this formed part of their strategy to gain diplomatic uh, recognition, which in turn would entitle them to the recognition of belligerent rights uh, from the British, which basically gives you a series of diplomatic recognition of the Palestinian <coughs> The presence of the Basque children, many of whom were Catholics and who appeared too terrified to return home, undermined Franco's claims to have carried out an orderly occupation and to be involved in a war in defense of the church. In early July 1937, the Francoists launched a massive propaganda and diplomatic offensive calling for the return of the children. They also began to search out the lists with the names of the children and to pressure relatives to sign requests for the return of their children. The Basque Children's Committee resisted, partly for political reasons. Some of its members felt that returning the children would equate to diplomatic recognition for the rebels and some at the grassroots could not bear the idea of sending children back to those they regarded as fascists and who they feared would try to inculcate the children with militaristic values. But a series of ethical and practical matters also stuck in the mind of the committee members. They knew that many parents were in exile, others were under arrest, and others still had been killed. They also knew that many parents had become impoverished by the Francoist repression and could not care for their children. They further held evidence that the Francoists were forging requests for the return of children. The committee therefore demanded convincing evidence of parental consent and safety before it would send children back. In the meantime, the right and Catholic press tried to whip up sentiment in favor of repatriating the children. On the 23rd of July, 1937, the Catholic Herald proclaimed that the children had been sent to England, this is a quote, for no other purpose than to foster British sympathy for the Valencia government. This is the Republican government that fled from Madrid to Valencia, and offered, and this is what the Catholic Herald offered, to pay up to £1,000 towards any expenses occurred in re incurred in repatriating the, the children. The Basque Children's Committee remained firm and studied each child's situation carefully and allowed children to return whose parents they believed had genuinely and freely consented. By April 1938, nearly a full year before the end of the official end of the Civil War, 1,722 children had returned to Spain. In October 1938, the committee continued to maintain 1,700 children in a network of 45 homes because, and this is a direct quote from the, the com committee's uh, documentation, the par their, their parents are themselves refugees, in prison, or missing. Even as late as mid-1939, months after the end of the conflict, the Basque Children's Committee felt it could not repatriate 577 of the remaining 1,054 children because their parents were variously in exile, missing, imprisoned, or dead. We have the testimony of one of these children who remained in the UK, and he's sitting right here, Anita And this is from a book, as we will see. Which, did you bring these books to sell? I did, yeah. I'm just wondering about time. Yeah, I'm finishing now. I'm finishing now. Uh, <laughs> mother had refused to sign the form claiming us even though she'd been visited by a priest and an official who had threatened to imprison her and take her children away. She said that if we returned, we would all starve, but her signature was forged. And I'm sure I'm you know, very happy to talk about this in, in the questions uh, and answers. How long have I got? Uh, you've overrun by five minutes. <laughs> okay, I'll just finish quickly by saying that um, a lot of the children who remained uh, in the UK, some of them returned uh, in the late 1940s, and some of them were very happy to return. We've got, I've got some quotes here about somebody who's getting on fine and, and with my mother, uh, but they're complaining about the um, shortages of food. Um, others are um, finding it very difficult to... Um, adapt. I'll just give you one quote uh, to, to give you a, a sense of how difficult it was for some people. Uh, so he wrote from Spain in 1947 saying, everything is so strange. I don't seem to be able to settle down here at all. Another young man wrote in 1947 and stated, 
my father is a fool and that Spanish people talk all day and night, concluding <laughs> that maybe later I shall like Spain. So I haven't really got time to go into all of this, but basically there was, it was quite difficult to, um, to go into, um, to, uh, to kind of reshape their identity, I suppose. Okay, I, I won't go into my conclusion, but just to say that um, this is obviously one of the most important uh, aspects of British refugee history. Nearly 4,000 children uh, brought to the United Kingdom in the face of intense uh, political opposition. It took an, all, an enormous amount of political pressure and the very particular circumstances of April and May 1937 uh, for that to happen. Um, and yeah, that's it. <laughs>